we obviously listen very closely to what the Fed says because Fed speak is is critical right now. Don't fight the Fed when the Fed says they're raising, the economy goes down. When the Fed gets dovish and and more accommodative, the economy usually heats up and, and valuations go up. So we pay particular attention to the Fed. I am grateful that you are back with us again today. We have Craig Berger back for this series of shows. And if you haven't listened to the last two days, I hope you will go back. You know, he had 12 years on Wall Street and he talked about that transition and ultimately telling you what he did wrong or what he feels like you could do better to help that transition uh, into commercial real estate. Also, some of the key hires that he made early and in even more recent, uh, you know, in there in his commercial real estate career and path. I, I wish I had thought about some of those things early on and it's still helpful even today. And then we got into deal sourcing. How do they find deals? What what's some of those broker relationships look like? How do, how do they do that internally? Which he was gracious to help us see some of the things that they do internally to make that happen. But today, a question that everybody has, Craig, uh, and I, I was just like, uh, everybody wants to know what's going to happen, right? And I know you've got the answers for what's going to happen. <laughs> So and welcome back, Craig. Honored to have you on the show. Grateful for your, your willingness to do a series of shows and us jump into a little deeper into some topics of how you operate and helping us learn from you. But, you know, I'd love to know, especially your your background in Wall Street and, and just the, you know, the market knowledge, you know, that you gained there and how you're applying that to your business now. I would love to, you know, just hear from you. I know the, the listeners would as well. Is, you know, what do you expect over the next six to 12 months? And let's dive into maybe the, the economy and how is that changing what you know you all are doing in-house or has it? Awesome. Thanks so much for having me again. You're a great interviewer. You asked insightful questions and I appreciate it. So you'll look in terms of the economy. It's a really interesting time right now. You know, 2022 is pretty much the first time in history that stocks and bonds have both dropped 20% or so. Usually if stocks drop, you have a flight to quality and, and bonds hold or vice versa, risk on, risk off. But this year has really been a sort of unique year in, in the history of the financial markets. But everybody's talking about inflation and how long does it keep going and how how high is it? You know, I have a bunch of thoughts on that. So, you know, Here's a few of my thoughts. First of all, inflation isn't 8%, it's like 30%, and the data is cooked and how they look at it and so on. Um, secondly, the main cause of inflation has been the Fed's Frankenstein experiment gone awry, known as quantitative easing. And a lot of people don't know what quantitative easing is, but during COVID to support the markets, the Fed started buying bonds from Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. And what does buying bonds mean? Well, it means that Goldman Sachs wrote on the back of a napkin, IOU, $50 billion and gave it to the Fed. And the Fed wired them electronically $50 billion of money that didn't exist 30 seconds before. And so the Fed's balance sheet went from 4 trillion to 10 or 11 trillion. First time ever that they bought bonds in that manner with quantitative easing. And so our M2 money supply grew by 45% from the start of COVID to the end of 2021. And that 45% growth in money supply means your money just isn't worth what it used to be worth. And that price is skyrocketed. That's in addition to the government support payouts for COVID, the, the relief payouts and stimulus checks and some of the current administration's spending programs, the infrastructure program or, or, or otherwise. So just a lot of growth between the Fed and the federal government. And that's why we have tremendous inflation. But today the Fed has stopped doing that and has reversed it and it's quantitative tightening. And they've only sold off or taken those dollars back from Goldman and Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. They've only taken like 5% of the dollars back. It's been very slow, but it's heading in the right direction. And it's, you know, that along with the meaningful and painful Fed rate hikes is, is I think starting to have a positive impact on inflation. And I think inflation is more or less on its way back down to more normal levels. Okay. No, that's helpful. I think, and that right there even shows your experience from Wall Street and, and you know, on the uh, the knowledge that you gained from there and how you're being, you're able to apply that to what you're doing now. Some insight there that I've had to like struggle to learn some of these things, uh, you know, that, that you were just living in, I think, you know, in that time. Uh, but, I, you know, I'd love to know, what are you watching right now? 
you know, like what's important to Craig on a maybe day to day basis as you're leading your your company and growth as you're, hey, you know, we're we're looking for more deals. But what are you watching right now in the economy? Well, we look at the the 10 year treasury on a daily basis. I do have one bridge floater where, you know, we have a cap on that deal. The rest of our loans are agency fixed, fortunately. But we look at the the 10 years a proxy for where cap rates are going. We obviously listen very closely to what the Fed says because Fed speak is is critical right now. Don't fight the Fed when the Fed says they're raising, the economy goes down. When the Fed gets dovish and and more accommodative, the economy usually heats up and, and valuations go up. So we pay particular attention to the Fed. We're obviously looking at all of the inflation readings, you know, CPI, wholesale data, right? We want to know where's this inflation thing going, right? I think last month, you know, apartment rents, which have been one of the causes of inflation, grew 0.2% month over month. I don't care about the year over year, that's just math, but I do care about month over month because whatever this month's month over month times 12 months is going to give you your year over year a year from now. And apartment rents grew 0.2% across the country. That's a 2.4% annualized rate, and it bodes well for the future of inflation. And so we're really looking at, hey, where do we think borrowing rates are going to be a year from now or 18 months from now? Where do we think cap rates are going to be 18 months from now? And based on all of that data, and how do we how do we play that? Yeah. Even like practically, where do you find that information? What do you watch every day? Is there a couple of websites? Is there because I get that question too? Like we know we might need to look at some of these things or we try to, but where do you trust, you know, find and trust that information coming from? CNBC.com is probably where I spend most of my time just for financial news, data, et cetera. You know, there's there's some others, but CNBC is a great source, thorough, you know, probably the the, the best around. Some people look at Bloomberg also. What about has your underwriting changed, or maybe your the types of deals you're looking at, or you know, you know, from what's happening in the economy right now and what you feel is happening or going to happen, any of those things, you know, how has that changed how you all are looking at projects and moving forward on deals? Well, our underwriting is is always changing. It's always in flux. There's some things that are always the same, but there's other other things that are always changing, right? Obviously, we're underwriting less rent growth, less rent pop on renovations, higher exit cap rates. Obviously, we're underwriting the current debt market conditions, which are totally different than they were a year ago. On Freddie floaters, we use the forward rate curve and and you know the forward rate curve a year ago was really wrong. And you know that's just some of the risks of forecasting, but you know our 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 model is constantly in flux and we're you know underwriting to higher cap rates, less rent growth higher interest expense, and we need to hit higher IRR. So 15 at the deal level isn't really going to work right now. We need an 18 or a 19 so that we can be attractive to potential investors and get them to part with their money during an economically challenging time. In terms of deals, we are probably looking more for A's and B's just because I think really lower end workforce stuff is folks are spending more of their money on gas and food and things have gotten a lot more expensive. And so I think it's harder for the class C communities to pay rent right now. It's unfortunate that the Fed has put us in this position, but it's reality. And I sort of, you know, have to be dialed into reality. So that's some of the things that, you know, have changed and and sort of how we're looking at properties right now. Yeah, no, that's some great information right there. I, I get the same question all the time. Yeah, definitely less rent growth. And and uh, you talked, you know, you talked also about debt being very different right now. Could you elaborate on that? You know, what that means to your underwriting a little more as far as uh, the type of debt you mentioned earlier, staying away from bridge debt at the moment. And uh, when would there be an option to do bridge debt right now? Or why would you? Or is it just like completely off the table? Uh, and some thoughts behind that. Well, buying a five cap and borrowing at eight percent means you're bleeding terribly. And I don't like to bleed. Nobody builds a business in this industry and moves forward unscathed through time. All operators are going to take some punches and deal with adversity, but I don't want to take more punches than I have to. And borrowing an 8% on a five cap deal or a four and a half yield to total cost going in doesn't feel good. 
Yeah. We, we would buy a bridge deal if it's a home run basis, if there's some reason why the asset's not performing, but it has to be exceptional. And I personally do think rates are going to come down. So I'm thinking of this next 15, 18 months is a great opportunity. I mean, there is going to be distress coming in the market. We haven't seen a lot of distress yet, but it is coming and it's because of the debt, right? I mean, you had folks paying very high prices in 21 and 20, early 22. A lot of them did take on very high leverage bridge loans and you get three years. And if, if you don't have strong financial performance, you don't qualify for your fourth year extension or your fifth year extension. And so there are a bunch of folks that, that took on deals in 2020 that are not gonna qualify for their bridge debt extension. And in 2023, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna have to sell at whatever price makes sense. So we do think there's some distress coming. We wanna be positioned for that. Obviously in debt, you know, the main, the main thing is rates are higher and leverage is a lot, lot lower. Yeah. Do you expect a recession or with, other than what we've talked about there? Do you expect a recession and how do you see that affecting properties or how you're prepared for that for your properties? So usually Fed rate hikes take like sort of 18 months to work through the economy. And, you know, they started raising six months ago. You just have heard that Facebook meta is laying off people. I think Amazon announced yesterday that there's 10,000 layoffs coming. Twitter has obviously laid off a bunch of people. You know, I think Google has a hiring freeze right now. So it is starting to work through the economy. On the other hand, a lot of parts of the economy are still robust. So I think it's more likely that we could have some soft landing scenario in, in 2023 than, than maybe what I expected, you know, four or six months ago. But we'll see how much the Fed overdoes it and what the sort of delayed impacts are from these aggressive Fed rate hikes and whether the destruction of wealth in the housing market and in the equity markets, how much those translate into economic spending impacts and, and so on. But economies held up better than I expected, but there is more weakness coming, so to speak. Yeah. What about even preparing for that as you're, if you, you know, you just closed on a project, how do you say you're prepared for, you know, that or what's coming? So we have a number of risk management techniques that we employ to, to guard against potential downside. We try to have a bundle of safety capital at the project level for each of our deals, margin of error project level. We try to have a bundle of capital at the corporate level, should our project level cash not suffice. We try to execute at a very high level and you know, make the properties perform as 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 good as is humanly possible. We sort of have to think outside the box on additional ways to market for tenants, screen tenants, do the background checks to ensure that we're putting ourselves in as good of a position as possible. So those are, you know, some of the things that we're doing to protect ourselves, project level cash, corporate level cash, and peak property level execution. But you know, we're we're on the ride. And if you own deals and you own a bunch of deals, you're on the ride. Maybe if you own A's and B's, you're in a slightly better position for this downturn than if you own B's and C's. I don't know, maybe some folks that are B, you know, in B properties downgrade to C properties and save money. So maybe there's, you know, there's cross currents, right? But, you know, like I said, anybody that builds a business and owns deals is, is going to face adversity and, and take punches along the way. Yeah, no, I appreciate all that. And you, but you mentioning, hey, you got safety capital reserves, right? It's safety capital per deal, and even at the corporate level as well. And then uh, we could, if you keep talking about this for a long time, I think, and and uh, pick your brain. But the last question before we move to a few final questions, Craig, is there a way that you calculate the amount of safety capital reserves, you know, that you have on hand per deal, or even at the corporate level that you could share? Well, um, you kind of know it when you see it. You know, there's not one specific metric, but we do try to keep three or four months of expenses on hand. And then depending on what our sort of institutional investor arrangement might be on any particular deal could influence how much cash we want, you know, from there. Of course, you know, there's also the CapEx, right? These properties do require a lot of CapEx to either maintain them or improve them. And that's sort of, we're always on a, you know, five-year look forward type of plan. So there's, you know, 
capex safety capital there's institutional investor safety capital there's operational safety capital i mean we've we've got various buckets of money and of course we have to hurdle all of that capital at the end of our deal and so we're paying for that margin of safety as sponsors but it helps me sleep better at night so you know that's that's how it goes you know, I completely understand. I've been criticized about how much we have in reserves sometimes. I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know, I have to invest. Uh, it's okay. Uh, you know, like we're we're going to sleep better along with every other investor. You're a survivor. Yeah. Are there any risk management things that I've missed that that are important to you? Uh, that that right there is usually like one of the first things I mention is like how much reserves you have in place. You know, it's like with no cash, you crash. Right. I mean, you got to be like you're talking about. You got to be able to withstand some knocks. And we know that there's probably going to be some knocks that we could, like, we didn't have any way to know about when we were planning this deal. Right. And so we want to even account for those the best we can. And you, like you said, you know, you can't know everything going in the deal. That is part of the business, but we do try our darndest to know everything possible. But then to, you know, not be completely complacent and say we do know everything right about the deal or we're going to, we want that reserve those reserves there up front. I would say, you know, we raise that up front. And so it's like, it's there. You know, some people say, oh, you know, I'll pull it out of cash flow over the first six months, 12 months. I'm like, oh, that's not me. <laughs> nope. You know, I want it there because some investors ask about too. You know, and actually I've had a few investors lately ask me that I've not been asked this before, but how well capitalized are, is this deal or this project that you're moving into, right? Or how much are you going to have on reserves? But even then, you know, you mentioned, Craig, too, the, the reserve capital, safety capital, like you said, at the corporate level. And I actually had an investor recently ask me that. It's the first time anybody's ever asked that. Uh, and I, I thought it was a good question. It's like, well, depending on how bad this gets, can you still pay your employees? <laughs> you know, how long can you still pay them? And so I, I, it's been a good exercise to think through that uh, and ensure, hey, we're prepared. And I think it even gives our employees some security, too, knowing that, hey, we're good for a long time, even if we can't do a deal. Right. So, Greg, what's your best source for meeting new investors right now? Well, we think of investors in a few different buckets. We've got institutional investors. We've got sort of middle market, maybe family office type of investors. And then we have individual high net worth investors. And we're building relationships with with all of those different classes of, of investors. And, you know, obviously there's pluses and minuses to you know, working with a large institution. And there's pluses and minuses to working with a you know, a hundred thousand dollar individual investor. So it really depends on what segment we're talking about. On the institutional investor side, we've got a bunch of relationships. We've we've pitched a bunch of deals to over the year, over the years, and you know, ninety nine percent have said no, and one percent have said yes. And as we continue to grow and scale and build our track record, we're we're looking to convert more of those no's to to you know live partners. Debt brokers and investment sales brokers have sometimes introduced us to to large institutional investors. Obviously, you've got conferences, other personal connections. I'd say those are some of the ways. I mean, there's a few shops that you know they're putting out large checks, and we just try to get in front of those folks. On the individual investor side, it's some of the same stuff. Warm warm leads, warm introductions, you know, maybe some LinkedIn connecting or, or, or marketing. I think LinkedIn's a pretty powerful platform. But yeah, look, there's no easy answer. Yeah. What about your best advice for passive investors? Make sure you choose good sponsors to work with, sponsors that don't have a crazy fee structure, sponsors that have aligned interests, sponsors that have a focus on ethics and integrity, obviously sponsors that have delivered, and then maybe diversify across multiple sponsors. So you don't have too much exposure to one or the other, and you can kind of spread it around a little bit. I mean, I love real estate. I think it's very controllable. If I was an investor, I wouldn't put a hundred percent of my money in real estate. I mean, it's an important part of a, you know, balanced overall portfolio. So a little bit of advice. Are there any metrics that you live by? It could be personally, professionally, it could be your bench press number. It could be how many mornings you get out of bed on time, or it could be something in the business. Like, no, I got to make sure we analyze this many deals or what would that, you know, a few important ones for you. That's a really interesting question. I don't know that I have any hard and fast benchmarks. We are developing KPIs and metrics for our company and our, each of our um, employees and hires and sort of, I guess, ultimately responsible for hitting our, our, 
corporate level KPIs and, and key metrics, but we just are most focused on, on growing and not growing for the sake of growing, but growing with quality projects that we can deliver for our investors on. But, you know, I just sort of, I know it when I see it, you know, my days are packed. We're out chasing our next deal or two deals. We're trying to engage a, you know, a deeper conversation with a bunch of institutional or potential institutional partners. And in the last 12 months, we've we've deployed more more capital in the last 12 months than we deployed in our first seven years in business combined. So we're growing and we, we want to say the same thing next year, if possible. What are some daily habits that you have that have produced the highest return for you? Wow. If you really want to tackle a task, you have to block off time on your calendar, turn off your email, turn off your cell phone and really focus. You know, sometimes I do that individually. Sometimes I take my capital market, Sky Lenny, and we go and pound the phones together without interruption for an hour or two hours and just block time off and, and compartmentalize. Other things that are that are important, again, sort of I mentioned key performance indicators, key numbers. We have to really know, hey, what makes any of our employees successful? What what is success for each of the different roles that we're, you know, that we have at the company. And all of those metrics and numbers, of course, are always under review. But those are just a few of the things that we focused on to produce results. And if we're closing deals, sales or dispositions, and we're delivering for investors, then that's sort of the ultimate measuring stick for whether we're being successful or not. What would you say is the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Hard work, persistence, stubbornness, perseverance, not giving up. I don't remember who said it. It might have been Thomas Jefferson, or I could have this quote wrong, but somebody, one of our founding fathers said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. So it's kind of like that. If you don't have the emotional fortitude, the financial fortitude, the risk tolerance fortitude, the ability to, you know, to take hits and 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 keep going, then you know, it's probably best that you, you know, work as part of a broader team because there is there is a lot of challenges to running your own business. And it's true whether you're doing multifamily or you're doing a, a tech startup business or any anything that you start, it's going to be a long road, right? This is a hyper competitive environment. There's not a lot of companies that are in business for 12 or 18 or 24 months and raise a $200 million seed round from Sequoia or whoever. Right. It's just it's it's more rare. Most people don't live in that type of entrepreneurial environment. So, you know, you have to be prepared to, to do the hard work and, and to persevere. For sure. How do you like to give back? We give back in a few ways. First of all, I'd say we're early in our in our corporate give back efforts. And as we grow and scale, we'd like to do more there. We've been somewhat resource constrained until six, eight, 10 months ago. We're still resource constrained, but we do take on interns and, and, and train young people that have an intense desire to learn the business. And, and uh, it's a win-win if you get some, some you know, good assistance. In terms of being in the apartment business, we do have the opportunity to help residents in need that are, that are truly in need, that are truly deserving of assistance folks that maybe we've had a long-term relationship with, or they've been excellent tenants and they've fallen on hard times. You know, we do have the opportunity at the corporate level to provide assistance to some of those folks. So we don't impugn property performance through those give back efforts. We sort of take that on at the corporate level. Obviously it's, you know, again, for folks that are, that are truly in need and, and deserving, you know, and then there's, you know, obviously charitable give back efforts. And, you know, I'd say we're, we're earlier in, in those efforts, but we're, we sort of have our eye on a few. Awesome. Craig, uh, it's been an honor to have you on the show and just uh, be willing to do a series of shows with you. Another great segment, just on your thoughts on the economy, the market, how that's changed your underwriting. I know the listeners learned a lot from you and are, you know, looking up to people like yourself, with you know, that have grown and scaled and persevered, like you talked about, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, and some insight into how you're looking at these things, especially with your experience, uh, you know, on Wall Street as well. Thank you so much uh, for your time and, and uh, for, you know, uh, spending this much time with me and, and our listeners as well. And being so transparent to share, how can they get in touch with you and learn more about you, Craig, and your business? 
Thank you so much for having me. You asked really great questions and I really enjoyed this. Anyone that wants to get in touch with me, just send me an email, craig at avidrealtypartners.com. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.